Hey, I'm Nathaniel Fawson. I'm a professional archaeologist, and I specialize in the pre-colonial archaeology of North America's eastern woodlands. I've been working and studying, and in some cases teaching, here in this region for over 10 years now. And uh, I know the, the channel's been quiet for a little while, but now that it's summer again, I should have a lot more time to, to be making some new content. So for the last couple of years, I've been doing a lot of research on the archaeology of caves and rock shelters, and I've been uh, going through that material on a much deeper level than I have before this spring. So there will be a lot of cave and rock shelter related content coming in the next couple of weeks. Um, but to kind of get this started, today I want to talk about um, who's an archaeologist who's really the, the patron saint of cave archaeology in North America, a woman named Patty Jo Watson. It's basically impossible to overstate how important this woman is to the development of archaeology as a science here in North America. So I'm going to start with some basic uh, biographical information on her and some of her early contributions to the science. Um, there are several references in this video to some other things that I've put out before, so you'll be able to find the links to those uh, down in the description. Now, Patty Joe was trained in paleoethnobotany, which is the study of humans and their relationships to plants, in Chicago back in the late 1950s, and she did a bunch of her grad school work on the early agriculture in the Near East. And in doing that, she was an innovator in uh, flotation techniques. So flotation at this point is standard operating procedure in uh, archeological field work, in large part because of the results of the work that Watson did back in the 60s. So what flotation does is as we're excavating, we'll take a regular soil sample, so maybe like if we're doing a, a pit feature, we'll take out half of it, or if we're doing a grid excavation, like a one meter by one meter uh, square, we'll take something like a 25 or a 30 centimeter subsample of each 10 centimeter level and run that into a flotation tank. So what that does is that it um, puts all of the material from that sample into suspension in the water, and the light stuff floats to the top and it can be taken off with, um, it, it can just be, be scooped up while the heavy stuff falls through and gets caught in a, a screen, typically a quarter inch or a, a 16th inch mesh screen, just like we would do in the uh, in dry screening or, or any other kind of uh, sampling strategy that we use. But the, the difference here is that it kind of takes all of the, um, the human element out of it. What floats, floats. What doesn't, doesn't. And so you don't have um, kind of discrepancies between who's doing the collecting. And it makes the samples really, really consistent and intercomparable with each other. So, and all, all that stuff, uh, the tiny little bits of burned seed and burned charcoals and burned nutshells and stuff like that, a lot of that would go straight through the screen and never get caught if it wasn't for a flotation method. So, it, it really changed the way we do field work in a lot of in a lot of ways. Now, Patty Jo didn't invent this technique from from scratch, but she reportedly had a big hand in um, developing the actual mechanisms and and tools that we use to do this in the field now. In 1963, she started working on the project that she's best known for, the archaeology of. Salt's Cave in kind of South Central Kentucky. And I've talked about this cave before in uh, Archaeology and Rites of Passage. And of course that link is down in the description. Now keep in mind that this research project began in 1963, which is one year after Lewis Benford published Archaeology as Anthropology, which if you've seen the Benford video, that kind of galvanized the archaeological community towards a more nuanced and scientific style of archaeology than what was the norm in the first half of the 20th century. So the year after Benford published the processualist manifesto, essentially, Watson really hit the ground running with this new style of research. She was drawn to Salt's Cave specifically because the preservation there was extremely good. It was... The, the pre preservation there is to the point that we can recognize human feces, uh, which we call coprolites, and 
we can identify them, recover them, and then process them and look at what people were actually eating, not make assumptions about what they were eating based on, you know, what we find on the site in relationship to them, but it came out of the, the human digestive system. They ate it. So that's what she went in there looking, looking at and looking for. So also because radiocarbon dating had been developed a little over a decade earlier, we could look specifically at when these, uh, these coprolite samples were, were created or excreted. Saltscape is going to need its own separate video. This is a multi-year project. They found a lot of stuff that wasn't human feces. Um, but one of the biggest revelations from that early work was that as early as the late Archaic period, people in Western Appalachia had domesticated plants. They had developed a, a gardening or horticultural tradition that had genetically modified uh, a group of proto-crops, essentially, like sunflowers or um, what's called uh, quinopodium, which is a relative of quinoa. It, they were they were so different from their their wild um, counterparts that we could tell they weren't the same uh, the same populations anymore. They'd been genetically modified. She she didn't stop there though. She also had specialists on her team take apart the copper lights and look for pollen so we could tell what time of year people were going into these caves because as pollens are in the air, you inhale them. They uh, get on your food, so on. They get suspended in the saliva in your mouth and you swallow them and they get incorporated into your digestive system. So she was looking at that also to look at what time of year. Then she took another step beyond that and looked at the materials that were in the soils that the copper lights were removed from. So once you have that extra step, you can look at what's in the copper lights, what's in the soil around it, and then you can say, okay, the difference is what they were actually eating. So you might find some things that are in the ambient soil around the coprolites. If it's in both of them, then you can't assume that that was actually consumed. But if it's only in the coprolites and not in the surrounding soil, you know that was actually eaten outside before these people came into the cave. So because she, was a, she took that extra step, she was able to show that the, the plant remains and the pollens were in the feces in much higher concentrations to what was going on in the ambient environment in the cave. So they must have actually been consumed. It couldn't be a contaminant um, or something environmental that like, we call it diagenesis when stuff from the environment is, is um, messing with the sample that you're looking at. So since her original findings here, a huge body of research has really uh, reinforced and corroborated those those initial findings that in the western part of Appalachia, at the very least, uh, the local hunter-gatherer communities were, they had developed a horticultural uh, tradition that was totally their own. It wasn't learned from someone elsewhere, another like immigrant group or whatever did not bring this to them like happened with corn, beans, and squash later. The uh, this Eastern agricultural complex, as it came to be known, was an indigenous Western Appalachian um, foodway and, and, and cultural uh, development. So this discovery kind of upends the traditional narrative about what we th generally think are the requisites for plant domestication. So these people are still semi-nomadic. They're, they're still moving across the landscape. Or... They're, they're hunting and gathering. They're not living in these densely populated, concentrated, permanent villages in most cases. They don't appear to have developed institutions of political power as the result of domestication for a long, long time after this. They were farming without behaving like farmers the way we would expect to, to see these sites um, play out if we were in the old world. Native Amer Americans are not playing by those rules whatsoever. So Watson was also one of the first people to apply practical experiments into her research. So she's having to excavate in a cave, and caves are really difficult places to work in because they are low-light environments, or in a lot of cases, no-light environments. And so they require a lot of... Um, 
planning and preparation and stockpiling of, of necessary materials to work. Especially when you're, you know, working in these really, really deep dark zones of caves, miles underground. So she did a series of experiments in how to supply light in, in these kinds of areas and found that with dry, dead river cane, you can make torches that, uh, you know, a three foot, four foot section of them will burn for about 45 minutes, which means if you're trying to, to go six miles underground, you're gonna need to either bring with you a huge bundle of, of cane torches or you and whatever group you belong to can have already stockpiled torches at regular intervals going throughout the cave so that when one burns out, you've got a pile of new ones to, uh, to take with you, to, to light up and keep going. So once she, once she figured out, okay, a three to four foot cane torch will burn for about 45 minutes, they start finding those piles of, uh, of stockpiled torches at about the time that they would need them when their own torches were going out. So this was a big deal because Watson was looking at the archaeology of the cave and she was looking at the materials she was finding and thinking about it in terms of the material remains of the human people who went into the dark with specific intentions and goals in mind and with a set of techniques that they had developed to be successful in accomplishing those goals. So remember that archaeology is not about collecting the, the stuff. I, obviously, there's no real material value in excavating and removing literal human shit. But it's, it's not about filling museums with this shiny garbage. It's about understanding the lives of people who, in most cases, have been dead for you know th hundreds of thousands of years. It's about understanding the processes that cause entire ways of life to, to change over long periods of time, to start gardening, to start using caves and rock shelters as homes or as sacred sites, to, to start using clay to make pottery instead of figurines, um, to, to start using copper and then to stop using it for tools and start using it for jewelry instead. So in, in this case, to, to start delving into the eternal darkness of caves to mine a mineral salt, which is what people at Salt's Caves were doing. The, there's a material in um, found inside these caves called gypsum that uh, they, were, they were mining out of the wall, off the walls in very large quantities. And she was able to kind of get inside the minds of these people who were doing this because she was having to do basically the same stuff. Although, you know, she was going after human feces and artifactual remains, whereas they were going in for gypsum and possibly um, some sorts of vision quest altered state kind of, uh, kind of practices. But back in the early woodland period, Appalachian people were delving miles into Salt's cave to, to mine for this mineral. And then, you know, she in the 60s, explored those same spaces to mine that information about them. And she was tempering that exper experiential research with really rigorous scientific verification, which is really what sets her apart from the pack, certainly at the time. Now, like I said, Salt's Cave is a big topic, and I'm going to have to uh, treat it on its own, maybe in one or two videos. Um, so I, that, that, that's something that I'll do in the future. But if you've got any questions about this or any other uh, things related to North American archaeology, please leave those in the comments. And as always, thank you for watching.